This is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And it's pretty good. So far I'm on chapter two. And I like the way it's laid out. It's laid out where it gives an example from one of them, their uh, military service. And then it defines the principle. And then it gives an example from the business world. So overall, the book is about extreme ownership and how a leader must take responsibility for everything that affects their mission or their goal. Everything that's in their power and in their influence, they are responsible for. So only with this kind of attitude creates like a culture of responsibility. So the first one, the military example they used was an incident of friendly fire under Jocko's command. So he had to take like full blame for that and how it developed more respect for him and his team. The second chapter was about, first it was about, um, it was about, they used the example of um, Bud's training to where they had one team that was consistently losing and one team that was consistently winning in their races. So they switched the leadership from the winning team and the losing team. And then those two teams actually became like neck and neck for first place on the next race. And the, uh, the principle for that was no bad teams, only bad leaders. And then they use an example of how one bad leader can affect the entire team and it brings everybody down. So it's kind of like the first two chapters were two opposites. Like a good leader can increase the respect and the productivity for the entire team and a bad one can bring everybody down. When you have somebody who just want to take accountability and is just constantly shifting the blame and cycles, then that is the standard you create. Like it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate, is the quote. And so if you have this, if you tolerate a standard of blame, that's what you're always gonna get. It's not, you can preach this extreme ownership but if you tolerate any amount of uh, deflecting responsibility, then that's the new standard. So whatever your standard is that you're trying to incorporate, if you ever accept less than that, or if you tolerate anything less than that, then that actually is the new standard because you've tolerated it. So yeah. Chapter two, so far, pretty good. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. So chapter three was about uh, belief, like a leader has to believe in his mission, in his cause. So they gave the example talking about whenever it was mandated that they had to include the Iraqi army in all of their operations. And then a lot of the, the SEALs didn't like that because the Iraqi army was like really bad at that point. Like they had very low trust because their loyalty wasn't secure. They were just very poorly trained, very poorly equipped. And it was a struggle to get the leadership of the United States military to get behind working with the Iraqi army because of those reasons. But so they didn't really believe in that cause. But the reason they didn't really believe in that cause was also because they didn't understand it. So they had to, the leadership had to get the, the military to understand like look if we don't work with them they're not going to get better and then we'll have to do their job forever like we have to get them to a point where they can 
manage all of this on their own so that we're not doing it. And so um, the business example was about uh, a CEO was implementing a new lower compensation for their sales team uh, strategy and the middle management didn't understand the strategy because they're like, well, this is going to push our lower performing salespeople out like they're going to leave. And they didn't understand it, but they were scared to ask, talk to the CEO about um, why they understood how it works, but they didn't understand why. And so the whole point behind it was basically so they could reduce overhead and reduce production cost. So with the lower cost, they could make more sales. That would be more volume, so they would actually make more money for the sales people who were performing. And so once they really understand that the reason why they're doing it, then they can start to believe in it. And so chapter three was about leaders have to believe in their mission. Chapter four was check the ego. And it seems pretty, seems almost obvious because with the extreme ownership, like you are responsible for everything. So you're going to have to check the ego and be at every level of failure. So every level of failure you're responsible for. But they gave a long example about um, basically like superiority complex in different units of the military. And they eventually had to send one unit away because they just couldn't function with the uh with the established with the established uh, military that was already there so they should have been like an extremely valuable asset but because of their attitudes and because of their ego they were dismissed and they like missed out on the action they wanted to be there because there was a lot of action and it was glorious but they couldn't deal with they're just too cocky. So, and it talks about in business, um, dealing with other people's ego. When a subordinate makes a mistake, you have to take responsibility for that in that you are responsible for being clear. and You are responsible for making sure that everybody understands their assignment everybody understands their responsibilities so if they make a mistake it's because you weren't clear it's because you didn't do your job efficiently or thoroughly so that there was even room for these mistakes to be made yep all right moving on all right reading out of extreme ownership by jocko willink and leif bavin so part two, chapters five, six, and seven, and eight. I like this book because the examples that he gives for these principles are real life and like life and death. So um, most, if you've read like self-help books or like in that genre, motivational books, You'll, you'll, hear the, you'll hear these principles before. They might be phrased differently, but Jocko gives like life and death situations for them all. So chapter five was called Cover and Move. And basically uh, the, the example he gave was Cover and Move, but the principle is basically uh, to synergize. He gives the example of like uh, retreating from a from a uh, firefight or like in, a, in a, a dangerous area. So he says one team should move while the other one covers them, and then in like a leapfrog motion, that's how they should uh, move out of uh, enemy enemy lines. But, yeah, so that's pretty much, that's chapter five. Chapter six was keep it simple. You'll always hear this. Just simplify things as much as possible. 
and that was chapter six. It's cool. He gives uh, military and business examples to for these things. So you'll hear the principles before, but he gives really good examples. And chapter seven was prioritize and execute. So basically pick the most important thing and solve that problem first and then um, move to the next thing and the next thing. So instead of trying to put out all of the fires at once, pick the biggest fire and not even like put out fires because uh, that's like, it's kind of like in the seven habits of highly effective people and it says first things first. So do the important things not necessarily always the uh, or the things that seem urgent because for this reason chapter 8 is decentralized command which is also could be said as delegate you can always delegate down the chain of command those smaller more urgent fires and so he says like Humans are really only capable of managing like six to ten people effectively at, at one time. So that's why they said their fire teams are like four or five people. And then everybody is reports to like, ha, takes report from like four or five people. And so the chain of command is broken up. They have decentralized command because responsibilities have been de delegated and you have to trust your people and and uh, back them up so yeah that was part two part two was five through eight chapters five through eight like I said you'll see a lot of these same principles come up in a, a lot of self-help books like pretty much all of those correlate with seven habits of highly effective people I think that was like the one of the biggest most popular ones ever but he, get, he makes it pretty cool with the uh, being a Navy SEAL obviously he has you know life and death scenarios that he can apply these concepts directly to and so that makes it pretty interesting all right finished extreme ownership this morning by Jocko and Leif Babin so part three is chapters 9 through 12 and chapters 9 was about plan planning and it says to learn the big picture understand the commander's intent so understand what the end goal is in your planning it talks about uh, when they were making their operation plans when they would make tons of slides for like PowerPoint presentations in their training and then when they got to Iraq what they needed was to make sure that everybody on the team understands the plan and the intention of the plan so as they understand the commander's intent they were able to maneuver and make decisions on the fly that would actually help achieve the goal and so as the chapters progress, as the uh, book goes on, all of the principles kind of build on each other. And um, at, at to the point where I think the last chapter is actually going to be the most important. And then you could actually work backwards from there. Uh, chapter 10 was leading up the command. So it talks about um, when you need things from your leadership, you know, they might ask for a lot of paperwork. They might ask for um, just things that it doesn't seem necessary for you to do. But if they're asking something, it's for a reason. And he, he asked the question, he's like, do, your, do you think command really wants you to fail? Do you think your boss really wants you to fail? You know, of course not, they don't. If they're asking you for certain information or certain documentation, then there's a reason for it. And maybe they don't understand what's actually going on from your position. So you need to make sure to provide all the info that's necessary for them 
Jocko talks about needing to get approval for their operations and the frustration with the questions that their commanding officers ask him. And he just comes to the realization that, well, they obviously need information. That's what they're asking for. That's what they need. And so I need to do a better job of providing that information and making clear what's actually happening right here on the ground. And so he actually goes as far as to ask the commanding officers to actually visit and ride along on some of their operations so they can really see. And in that way, they actually build more trust with their commanders and are able to have more of their operations approved. Chapter 11 was decisiveness amid uncertainty. And he's basically saying, situations will never be perfectly clear. You know, and you need to, sometimes you need to make the hard decision versus deciding not to decide. There are situations where you'll need to wait and see. And actually the military example that he gave in this was kind of a wait and see situation because uh, one of their snipers had somebody in their sights in a window and they need to double check who it was. And so he's asking the army guys to clear the building once again. He's like, I've seen somebody in this window. I've seen a, a, a silhouette of a man with a scoped weapon in this building. And the army's like, the army guys are telling the SEALs, well, fucking take him out. You know, he's going to, if, if you fail to act decisively, he could kill some of our guys. And obviously that would be like the worst case scenario. But he's like, well, if I, if I take him out now, it, there's a lot of our guys in the area. We need to make damn sure who, who this is. And so he tells the army, army guys, clear the building again. And so they're kind of pissed off, but they do it anyways. And as the sniper, the SEAL sniper, sees them heading towards the building, he's like, oh, damn. I got my buildings mixed up. They're in an urban area. No street signs, no address numbers on the buildings in Iraq, Ramadi. So he realized, well, that was a confusion. If I had not pretty much insisted that the army had cleared the building again, like that would have been a friendly fire. Like that would have been, that would have been the worst case scenario. So decisiveness amid uncertainty, like you have to make the hard decisions and well, people will respect that versus, you know, deciding not to decide and basically weak leadership. Chapter 12, like I said, I think um, probably the last chapter was the most important because all of the principles are kind of building on each other. It's like precept upon precept because it kind of talks about all of the other principles in this one. Chapter 12 was Discipline Equals Freedom. Right? I think that's the title of his next book and his podcast and stuff like that. I'm not sure. I don't watch it. But, um... They were talking about whenever the Iraqi courts started demanding more strict protocols for evidence collection so that it would be more useful in court. And he was talking about um, coming up with the process for collecting evidence and how a lot of them were, a lot of the SEAL teams were resistant to the new procedures that they came up with. But in the end, it actually did save them a lot of time and they were actually able to go on more missions and their evidence was more uh, compelling because of the system that they used to collect it. And it just goes into all the ways that, you know, being disciplined, sounds like a paradox discipline equals freedom it sounds like a paradox but being disciplined creates more opportunities for freedom whenever things are organized and controlled then when you need to make changes you can make changes more efficiently and more effectively because 
things are disciplined. Talks about just be, having, having an early wake up time creates the time that you need to do other things that will in turn make the rest of your day easier, make the rest of your mission easier. So discipline equals freedom because it creates more opportunities for freedom. So yeah, that was Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. I think, you know, with, with these kinds of books, you should probably not just read through it all in a day or two. You should probably take your time and kind of digest the concepts and, you know, read it twice. Read it a, a chapter a week, something like that. And, and of course, apply what you've read immediately. So, thank you for watching. That's it.